How many out there like baseball? Huh? How many out there like baseball? Huh? Raise your hand. How, how many out there have played baseball in the past? Okay, good, good. A few of you. Uh, I, I, I was actually surprised to meet someone who did not like baseball. Uh, are there any of the, well, no, maybe I shouldn't ask that, you know, maybe uh, all of a sudden you might get tackled, who knows, but anyway, I, I have here in front of me just kind of a, a way for us to remind you about baseball today. I've got two bats, in fact, so I guess if we need to go uh, uh, bat something today, we could uh, be able to do that if that is needed at some point. In fact, I think this may actually be a bat that I used on a baseball diamond right behind Washington Elementary School when I was a child. I had a chance to be able to go down there recently and be able to kind of look at some of the baseball diamonds down there and everything. And I was thinking about this, that I can remember when I was young and playing baseball, you know, we kind of just did it for fun, right? We weren't really looking for all of kind of like statistics and all that type of stuff. And yet I can remember them clocking some of our statistics as even as young children of what our statistics would be. In fact, the batting average. Yeah, I mean, maybe you're familiar with batting averages. Maybe, maybe you don't know anything at all about uh, batting averages whatsoever. Do you understand how batting averages are, are figured out? For those, yeah, a few of you are going, no, I, I don't know. Well, I'm going to try to explain it, but I'm also going to look at my notes as I do. They call a perfect batting average 1,000. It's actually 1.000, okay? But they call that 1,000. So say, for example, if you come up to bat and, and you bat and, and you have a few times, maybe you walk or maybe you get hit by the pitcher, and, and that doesn't necessarily count, but, but say for example you get up to bat, you hit a single. Do we all know what a single is? Okay, you're with me? If we say a double, no, I don't know what a single is, it means you got to what? Okay, first base, good. If you got a double, where did we arrive? Oh, good, we're all on the same page, or at least some of us are. If I got a triple, what does that mean? I got to? And if I got a home run, I got to go all the way around. I love that. And so basically each time that you hit the ball, that works into your average. So say for example, you're up to bat and you are a person who in your season you get 300. Okay, so that means that on average, every time you've come up to bat, out of 10 times you've been up to bat, you hit three times. Am I good so far? Everybody's agreeing, you're with me, okay? So this, for some of you who all of a sudden you're thinking statistics, okay, so 300, you know, that must be, that must be a low average then, right? No? Okay, there's a few of you who are baseball fans out there. You understand what I'm talking about. 300 is really not that bad. It's actually exceptionally well. In fact, uh, when you look at major leagues uh, right now, some of the averages are, uh, I think, out of the top 25, about 346, 383, and 326. In fact, in the major leagues, uh, 280 is, is really good. If, you, if you're batting 280, there's probably a good chance you're not going to get traded to another team, right? You know? I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's all a money thing anyway, you know? Or if all of a sudden, if you're batting 300 average, you know, you might actually be an all-star. If you're, if you're batting 400, that 400, you're probably one of four people in an entire century that's probably going to have that kind of a scoring for your average. And of the top 25 right now, 12 are above, of the top 25 players right now in the major leagues, 12 are 300 or above. Now for our Ohio teams, I was looking at the top 25, we have two players from Cleveland in that top 25. Do you happen to know how many players from Cincinnati happen to be in that top 25? Oh, man, zero. Yes, zero. In fact, the, the, the best at uh, right now for the Cincinnati Reds, the highest batting average is 267. So as you can see, a batting 1,000 is almost impossible. So let's take that baseball analogy 
and let's transfer that to our spiritual life. How do you feel your spiritual batting average is right now? In fact, uh, I was thinking about Jesus. Whenever Jesus came up to bat, Jesus' spiritual batting average was 1,000. I'll just tell you that. Jesus' batting average was 1,000. And nobody could possibly come up and be even close enough to Jesus' batting average spiritually. I mean, Peter and the disciples attempted to do so, but they never could quite get it. In fact, we've been following along with Peter and the disciples this summer in this disciple series, and we've been asking five relevant questions. Five questions of us that are relevant not only for them at the first set of disciples with Jesus, but are also relevant for us. The first one we asked was, who do you say I am? And that's the praise and worship question. That gives us a chance to be able to focus on who Jesus is. And when we ask that question, it, it, it says, am I learning to know who Jesus is? Can I be able to define who he really is? By the way, hi sis. My sister decided to come and surprise me today. So I was just kind of like, you know, it's not my birthday, but it's her birthday. And so she decided to come celebrate her birthday with us for worship today. So thank you so much. Do you understand what I have done? That's the second question. I feel like, I feel like that's a way that I can say how good God is. That's a testimony question. That gives us a chance to be able to look at where he has been working and what he has done. And to me, I can say that when it comes to my sister. Because God has helped her and strengthened her and given her an incredible family there in Kentucky to be able to be a part of supporting her. I called her and wished her a happy birthday on Friday. And I hear this beep, 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 beep. I said, what are you doing? Are you backing up? And she said, yeah. I said, here at 8 o'clock in the morning, I just got my groceries and I'm, and I'm backing up and, 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 and uh, William is coming to pick me up here and be able, this is, this is our family affair on Friday mornings is getting our groceries. To me, that's beautiful. And to me, that gives me a chance to be able to see where God has been at work because it allows me to be able to see a family that's working together to help my sister and encourage her during difficult times. The third question we were at was a question called, are you listening to me? This is the question where we dialogue with God and we get into scripture and we're able to kind of take some time to be able to say, do I understand what God is saying in scripture? And as I do dialogue with him, I'm trying to figure out, do I understand it? And as well, can I journey along with some other folks who will help me to be able to learn exactly what God's word is saying? And not only hear what it is saying, but what we will do about it. And that's where we've arrived at question four. Question four gives us a chance when we look at it, do you truly love me? That Jesus then says to Peter, would you feed my sheep? And that's exactly what he is saying to us in question four. And I'm just curious, what do you think Peter's batting average, spiritual batting average might have been? You know, we, we've been joking around. I mean, here is this guy who keeps opening mouth and inserting foot, right? And he just keeps doing it over and over again. And Jesus asks him in this question this week, do you love me? And because I think Peter is dwelling on past failures, like sometimes you and I can, I think it's hard for him. And Jesus says to him, even in the midst of your failures, I'm here to work with you like a coach. Uh, he probably has his ball cap on. If I brought a ball cap, maybe that would have been helpful there. But like the coach, he says, Jesus, uh, Peter, said, Peter is talking to Jesus, and I'm here, Jesus, as Jesus to you, as your master. I'm here to restore you, Peter. I'm here to restore you to your true purpose. And your true purpose, Peter, is to glorify me in all you say, in all you do, and all that you are going to become. And he doesn't ask Peter to be perfect every time. <laughs> you know very well, a thousand bat and a thousand is going to be a little bit difficult. But he's not telling Peter that you need to be perfect every time. But he's asking him, I want you to get up, and I want you to try to hit the ball. And 
So what Jesus doesn't ask for, he doesn't ask for perfection. Jesus asks for progression. And so if you're filling in your uh, handout today, that's going to be your first one that helps you out there. Jesus asks, do you love me? And he doesn't say it to condemn Peter or nor to condemn you, but what he actually is doing is, is he's saying it to commission us. Jesus invites Peter and invites us to care for his flock. But before we can fully embrace the calling that he invites us to, Last week we talked about it, that he first has to heal, heal Peter through his brokenness. He had denied him. And we have a lifelong goal, just like Peter does, of an attempt to try to bat a thousand spiritually. We won't make it all the time, but that's our goal, is to bat a thousand and the question, do you love me, isn't just for Peter, it's for you and me today as modern day disciples. And so, just as, as it says, disciple, you're the disciple, do you love me? Jesus is going to ask that to us this week. And so we're going to look in John chapter 21. And I'm going to invite you, if you're physically able to stand, let's be able out of respect of God's word to be able to stand and read God's word together today. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. We read a portion of this last week, but we're going to expand it just a little bit further. And so after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Could you just do me a favor? Say those four words. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him this. And then Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then he says then take care of my sheep. Could you repeat those words? Then take care of my sheep. This is what Jesus said to Peter, and I, I think it's what he says to us. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Can you say those four words? Then feed my sheep. In verse 18, he tells Peter, he says, You know, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself. You went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and others will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to let Peter know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus told him, <laughs> Jesus told him just exactly how this whole journey begins. He just says to him two simple words. Can you say those with me? Follow me. And that's what he's saying to us today. Jesus this is your word for us today, and we're ready to hear from you. We're not ready to hear from just me and what I have felt you've been teaching me. More importantly, we're ready to hear from your Holy Spirit. So would you speak to us? Would you use your word to penetrate our hearts? And may we hear from you, and not only hear from you just to tickle our ears, but may we hear from you be, to be moved to action. I pray that in your precious and holy name. And all God's people said... Turn to someone to your left or to your right and you say, guess what? We got to go feed sheep this week. And then you may be seated. Now, guess what? We really don't know just how this conversation takes place. We don't know if the discussion was just between Peter and Jesus. We don't know if, if Jesus then said this in front of all the disciples. But the things we do know is it's remarkable to see that by a way of forgiveness, Jesus gives Peter a job to do. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? To know that when Jesus forgave you, he was looking for you 
to start doing some work. And so for Peter, giving him his forgiveness that he needs, Peter is now going to be given a job. And so this breakfast by the sea, man, think about it. Fish for breakfast. Have you had fish for breakfast, Mark? Have you? Oh, my goodness. I could just imagine it right off the, right off the boat there early of the morning. Fish for breakfast. And, and so this breakfast by the sea becomes a fresh start for Peter. In fact, from self-serving to Savior serving, you and I both learn to serve side by side with Jesus. Uh, Jesus doesn't come to question Peter's sincerity. In fact, even, even if you think about it three times, we could all go geek out on Greek if you'd like to. Uh, we, could, we could do that if you really want to, geek out on some Greek. And we, we have three things that could be said here. Phileo, uh, and I'm not talking about filleting fish either. A phileo is one of the words for love. Phileo is to be a friend to someone. It's to be fond of someone or an object. And it's, a, it's kind of like a fellowship type of love. It's, it's living and growing in relationship between two friends. Phileo is the love that is tender affections, but it always requires a response, and it expects a friend to respond with that kind of love. So it's a, a friendship type of love. Now, we're not talking about a marriage type of love. Marriage love is more for eros, and that's for lovers, those who have a deep, deep committed love to one another. Phileo is what we're first talking about here. It's, it's a love between two friends. Friends. My son lives just outside of Philadelphia, and that's the, that's the place, Do we all know what it's called. It's the town of brotherly love. Good. So we're familiar with that. Agape is another form of love that Jesus is using here. And agape is unconditional. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love of choice. The love where we serve with humility. It's the highest kind of love that could ever be taking place through someone. It's a love of the will. It's an intentional conscious choice that you choose to love. Agape is voluntary. I make a choice whether to love. Phileo is emotional. And it's something that stirs within you to say, we're going to work together for a common goal here. It's kind of like saying the community churches of pastors and some people in the community that I've been praying with monthly. We're going to get together under a tent in the park. And we're going to work together to see Jesus' name proclaimed in this community. So those are the kind of loves that we could be talking about and geek out on the Greek. But what we really just want to be able to focus on is John 21, 15. He asks the question, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more, Peter, than your old profession? Do you love me, you know, more than fishing? Oops. You know, I don't know if that hurts or not for some. But do you love me, Peter, more than your tools of the trade, your boat, the nets, the, the long hours? Do you love me more than you love your fellow disciples? Hey, Peter, do you love me more than your fellow disciples love me? And so he first asks him twice, do you agape, sacrificially love me, Peter? And then a third time, he asks him, do you brotherly love me? And so three times he asks, and Jesus really wants to know, does Peter know who Peter is? And does Peter know how he can love at this moment and this time? Is Peter persuaded to, to love Jesus with everything? Or is he stuck with his past failures and dismissing Jesus' love for him, and, and is he wondering what his future really is going to be like? Is, is Jesus really going to want me to be a part of it? So Jesus didn't see Peter's failure as his destiny. Peter saw it as a pathway, a pathway to restore his purpose. And to be honest, that's what he sees for you and for me. I could have been so stuck in my failures, but yet God was telling me, David, I want us to join together to do something great for God. And if you'll join me, we can do that. 
And Jesus didn't see Peter's failure as his destiny, but as a pathway to restore his purpose. In fact, Peter has to have each of these scenarios running through his mind of how he denied him, how he just kind of said, no, I can't do that, how the multiple times he opens his mouth and sticks his foot in his mouth. But yet he is being asked, do you agape love me enough that you would be willing to sacrifice yourself for me? Jesus doesn't change his love for Peter based on Peter's performance. And guess what? He doesn't do that for you as well. He will still love you no matter how you perform. You may have a great day one day. You may have an incredible batting average that day spiritually. And then the other next day, you may have a pretty poor response you may realize you're dealing with some feelings towards someone, some anger, some being upset. You may realize, man, that person at my work just pushed my buttons. That may be a pretty low spiritual batting average that day. But God is looking for us to work with him each and every moment, just like he's asking Peter. Because he's asking Peter, he goes, I want to commission you, I want to give you a job. And right now, from where you are, Peter, you're living in a brotherly love. You can do that with me. And guess what? I can work with that. You may not be at the sacrificial love place right now, but I can work with you right where you are. And I hate to say it, but most of us are a lot like Peter. <laughs> Been there? Done that? We've made promises to Jesus. We've said, you know, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, I'm going to trust you with everything. You may have said, Jesus, you're my shepherd, I'm going to follow you. You may have said, you know, I, I'm dying to myself, and Jesus, I'm going to live for you. In fact, Jesus, you know what? I'll lay my life down for you. I'll even go to prison and die for you. You might be like Peter. Most of us, though, just like Peter, we've denied Jesus. We've put our foot in our mouth a few times. And with our lifestyle, with our choices, we've kind of chosen to deny Jesus as a part of our life. But where Peter denied him, our denials are not normally as public as Peter's were but they are every bit as obvious to our Lord because he sees our heart. And just like Peter, we can begin weeping, we can, we can be feeling like, you know, Jesus, you don't see me, you don't want this to happen, we don't, we don't want to move forward, or I'm unworthy to be able to work with you. And Jesus says, guess what, I've heard your confession, and guess what, I still love you. In fact, I delight that you've chosen to confess to me. I've, I want your response of love. And guess what? I'll work with you right where you are. And I'm going to invite you into an eternity-changing partnership with me. You want to ride? Let's go. And it's in that moment that Jesus will invite you into little heart-to-heart -heart conversations in order for you to find out where are you at that moment in your walk with him. In fact, at your bottom of your handout there, it's just one line and it says, do you love me? Maybe you would choose to just write your name in that line. Do you truly love me? Put your name in there. On three, I want you to say your name. Are you ready? One, two, three. Do you love me? Truly, more than anything. Or Jesus is asking, am I just a convenience for you? We often confess, Jesus, I've messed up. I've messed up so badly. I, I promised that once that I loved you that I would lay down my life with you and for you and now I'm embarrassed to say that I, I'm even sad to bring this up, but I I, I probably can only say, can we just be friends? 
and without noticing our failures. Jesus doesn't even take note of your stumbling attempts. He says, guess what? <laughs> Come on. Feed my sheep. Care for my lambs. Feed my lambs. It's like he says to each of us, I knew how weak you were when you thought you were strong. And I know how strong I can empower you to be now that you recognize some of your weaknesses. Guess what? He says to you, you take care of my lambs and I'll work in you right where you are at this point in your journey with me. And I'll continue to work in you and through you and guess what? Together, we'll build my kingdom. Jesus says, do you love me? And you and I, our love oscillates. I mean, there'll be some days, man, where we are on fire. And then there'll be other days where we're a little temperate. And we need to answer the question. Answer it regularly. Once again, say your name on three. One, two, three. Oh, come on. I can't even, all I heard was, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, maybe like, you know, Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, I can't hear your name, okay? I want to be able to hear it on three, one, two, three. Do you love me? And guess what? Wherever you are, whether you are an immature newborn learning just how to love, or if you've been around the block and there's been some seasons where you've been pretty hot and maturing unconditionally, Jesus will use you and walk with you and he will say to you, feed my sheep, care for my lambs, feed my lambs. Let's do this together. And so Jesus' question to you and I today, do you love me? It calls you and I to examine our hearts, embrace his forgiveness, and commit to a life of devoted discipleship. That's not going to be on your handout, but you know, I might even say it again if you want to write it down. Jesus calls us to examine our hearts, embrace his forgiveness, and commit to a life of devoted discipleship application of being a disciple. What does that kind of look like, Dave? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, what, if, what if you were asked, what if you decided to say, you know, Jesus, would you tell me where are some sheep in my life right now? This first could be tending the, sh the, the field of your own heart. You could be one of the sheep. You could be realizing, I need to work on some things, and so I need to tend the field of my heart so it's ripe and ready when Jesus is ready to move me to the next level. Maybe it's, maybe it's supporting a family member. <laughs> maybe it's encouraging your fellow church attendees. Maybe it's reaching out to someone who doesn't yet know Jesus. And how could you do it? Well, maybe you could use acts of kindness to look for opportunities to show kindness to someone, whether it's through simple, simply smiling at someone. I mean, to tell you, I've been really kind of shocked at how much, you know, when you go through Walmart and you smile at someone, they either look like they're ready to hit you with their bag because they're thinking you want something, or they're kind of like, wow, what's up with this guy? You might, you might look at integrity. <laughs> Maybe a few of you are, are thinking, you know, maybe I could live in a life of integrity. Maybe I could uphold honesty, diligence, and fairness in my professional life, in my workplace. And I'll be honest, that right there is a strong testimony to some of your colleagues who will realize Jesus is a part of your life. Uh, maybe generosity. Maybe you would be generous with your time, your resources, your money. Maybe you would support those in need and give to a cause to be able to help them out. Maybe, maybe you need to forgive. Maybe you would practice forgiveness even when it's difficult. I mean, I don't know about you, but there are some of us who continue to hold grudges. And those grudges... 
they can hinder our relationship with God and with other people. Maybe you might even choose at some point to share your faith. Maybe, maybe you would know when it's appropriate to share your faith with someone who doesn't know Jesus. And you don't have to be forceful. You know what it could be is you just simply telling your story of what Jesus means to you. And maybe they could be invited to join you at church. Maybe you'd even take them out to lunch afterwards. Stephanie. Stephanie was an 11-year-old, and she heard at her church that there was going to be a work and witness team that was going to Australia. And as she heard about this, she went up to Daddy. She said, Daddy, Daddy. She goes, can I go? And Daddy said, you know, honey, this trip costs $3,000. And so, you know, we don't have that kind of money right now. And so, you know, I, we just, you just can't do that. And she said, but daddy, daddy, I really feel like Jesus is telling me that I need to go. And so this is what dad said. Dad said, you know, if you can raise the money to go, then you could go. Anybody out there know that you don't dare a child? Right? Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, Stephanie prayed. She prayed and she made a few phone calls. And guess what? The $3,000 was raised and she was headed on the trip with the team. And all of a sudden, a parent and a family member had to figure out how am I going to put $3,000 together to go. And so one of the plans for their missions trip to Australia was to partner with an on-campus ministry that was going to be ministering to college students. And they had a house at the edge of campus that they had bought. Kind of like I think I remember you telling me for Moorhead State, right? Moorhead had one there. And so uh, as well, so she began praying to be able to go. And, and this is what they were going to do. They were going to be going and handing out flyers, handing out Bibles. Maybe it's kind of like us going, uh, uh, using, using the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth as we go along for a parade and we hand them all out to people. And someone just begins to open them up and learn about who Jesus is. So as soon as they got there, they learned when they arrived that a brand new student body president had been elected. And she was an atheist, and she had decided that during her term of office, there will be no Christian activities on campus whatsoever. And so this team had paid thousands of dollars to be able to go on this missions trip to Australia. And they were trying to figure out, what are we going to do? And they made a decision. They went back to that campus house... And they decided they were going to begin praying. And so they, they walked back to that house, all except one. They didn't quite realize that Stephanie had wandered off as they were headed back to that campus ministry. And as Stephanie wandered off, Stephanie found herself at the campus ministry offices where the student council president had her office. And Stephanie knocks on the door and Stephanie goes in and she says, Hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm from the United States and, and I'm going to be praying that you give your life to Jesus. And she starts to walk and go towards the door and open the door. And as she does, she turns around and she says, Oh, and I'm not going back until you do. Bye. And she walked out the door. And as she walked out the door, she found people all across the campus who are hunting for Stephanie, trying to find her because they realized she wasn't with them. And so once they finally took her in hand, they took her back to the campus house. And they began praying. Monday, throughout the entire day on Monday, they began praying. Into Tuesday, they began praying. And Tuesday night at about 7 o'clock, Stephanie began crying. And we're not talking like some kind of a whimper cry. We're talking about crying out loud. I think I heard a child just down the hallway crying way out loud today. And so, just like that child was crying, Stephanie begins crying at 7 o'clock at night. And for four hours, she cries. Been there? Done that? Got the t-shirt? And the sleepless night? Hmm? 
In fact, at 11 p.m., they're also, they're beginning to wonder, oh my goodness, we shouldn't have brought this child with us. Oh, what did we do? And at 11 o'clock, she stopped crying. She smiled. And she said, can I have a piece of bread? Can I have a cracker? I, I'm done praying. I'm ready to go to bed. And so, for four, they're just kind of looking at each other. What's going on here? The next morning, Wednesday morning, there's this knock on the campus ministry door. And when they answered the door, there was this untidy woman. She was in disarray. Her hair was just about everywhere. Her clothes were wrinkled and disheveled. It was the student body president. She said... Where? Where is that little girl? I haven't been able to eat. I haven't been able to keep my mind focused on my schoolwork. I haven't been able to sleep. Something is telling me that I need to come here and I need to ask Jesus into my life. And so they welcomed her into that campus house. And as they did, they led her through making a decision for Jesus to become her king and the Lord of her life. And on that same day, on a Wednesday, there was a gathering of all the school students. And there, she says, this student body president stands before them and she says, Hey, there's a group here from the United States and they're working with one of our campus groups. They're a, they have a very important message for you. And if you want to hear what they have to say and what Jesus has done for me, we'll meet you at the cafeteria at lunch today. Stephanie, this little girl who heard the Holy Spirit speak to her, she obeyed the Spirit speaking. She prayed and she prayed until God made a way for her to go and that she became an instrument in that missions trip. God is looking for hearts who are ready to obey and to listen. And when you and I grow in our sensitivity toward Jesus and the way that he cares for earthly things and other people, our priorities begin to change and our lifestyle begins to look more like the master. Matthew 6 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Colossians 3, it says, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And it continues in verse 23, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Does our love for Jesus make him and what he wants more important to us and what we want and what we see as important? As you and I grow as disciples who are following Jesus and begin to know who he is and follow and press in to follow him, the Holy Spirit will help us to see how badly our heart is divided. And our failures in a divided heart, they do not define us. But it's Jesus' love that wishes to refine us. We realize we value things. We value positions, and sometimes they are alignment with Jesus, and other times they're aligning to our self-centeredness. And so sometimes we have to start realizing Will our self-centeredness overrule what Jesus wants? Or will we lean into what Jesus wants moment by moment? As you grow in knowing Jesus, we become increasingly aware who Jesus is, how he lived, how he died, and what he's doing and why he's doing it and why he's inviting us to partner with him. And as our love for him grows, our awareness of his love gets a chance to be shared with other people. 
And he's determined for us to be his disciples and to follow him. And no matter what we have cherished before, choosing to begin cherishing what matters to him so that we can multiply the message of hope when it comes to other disciples we connect with. It really kind of hit me hard this week when I was thinking about that, and I had a chance to talk to Lisa at God's Hands at Work this week. Both of our ministries have attempted to interact with a young man who was shot and murdered this week. And it broke both of our hearts, and we weeped over the phone with each other. And we realized that both of us have had an opportunity to be able to be God's hands and his feet to this young man. And we both had to ask, did we do enough? Second Corinthians 5 says, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves, but instead they will live for Jesus Christ who died and was raised for them. And that them is you. 1 John 4 says, we love each other because what? He loved us first. And when we love, our love begins to mature each time we love for Jesus and for others. And can I just tell you, it may not be a perfect performance. But guess what? It does mean if you will go to bat each and every time, you're progressing. You're getting a chance to progress. And you're having an opportunity that in the past it's been imperfect performance. But you have an opportunity to make progress in your performance in order to be able to follow Jesus. And when you do perform, <laughs> I know sometimes that can kind of sound like a little weird for me to say that, but when you do perform for Jesus, when you do the work that he's calling us to do, it actually feeds you. It becomes spiritual food for you. John 4, 34 says, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing that work. Jesus is saying, my food is to accomplish the will of the Father. And doing the will of God, when we partner with him, it will begin to nourish our souls. So, Dave, what are you saying? What, what can we do this week? Well, once again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Here's some specific steps you could take this week. Maybe you would choose to reach out to someone in need. Maybe you would choose to volunteer with either our church ministry or volunteer with one of our partner ministries here locally. Maybe you would choose to say, you know, hey Dave, I'm going to pick up that sheet out there and I'm going to fill a crisis care kit or I'm going to put some contribution or money towards crisis care kits because I know you and Alicia are going in September on that missions trip and, and I'm going to be able to, to help you out with that. Maybe you would reflect on your own life. And you might just say, here's a place where I need to make a change. Here's a place where <laughs> I need to get back up to bat and I need to do better this week. Jesus says, ready? Say your name. One, two, three. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Jesus says, if you will love him, he's willing to work with you right where you are. And do you truly love him more than you love anything else? But where you are right now, he just invites you. He says, come. The next time you're up to bat this week, let's feed sheep. <laughs> let's show kindness. Let's do something that we can say we mattered for Jesus this week. Maybe you'll say, you know what? Let's just close our eyes and bow our heads. Let's, let's do it this way. Maybe you would say this week, Jesus, I'll go to bat for my family. 
Uh, I, I want to be able to say, I want to be a part of discipling my children, my grandchildren. I, I want to be able to listen to you, and I want to be able to follow your lead, that that way you can be able to help me to be more like Jesus. Maybe you would say, hey, I'll go to bat for my church family. I'll go to pray for that need. I'll, I'll go to help out that person. Maybe you would say, I'll, I'll go to bat for a few lost friends, neighbors, or co-workers in order to anticipate the opportunity where God gives you an open door to talk about Jesus. Jesus says, do you love me? And he's calling you and I today to examine our hearts, embrace his forgiveness, and commit to a life of being devoted disciples. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? I'm going to invite you to pause. Listen for what Jesus wants to say to you today. Listen for how he wants to work through you to be his hands and feet. <laughs> the, the phrase I like to say, Jesus with skin on. How will he give you the opportunity to be Jesus with skin on? And guess what? When you get up to bat this week, it could very well be it's going to be a, it's going to be a 300 week. It may be a 100 week. It may be that you'll miss it this week completely. But he is saying, I forgive you. I want you to seek me. I want you to know I love you right where you are. And guess what? I can work with you right where you are. Let's do something together. Feed my sheep. Care for my lambs. Feed my lambs. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, it's going to be hard for you to do something like this, but there could very well be something in your heart that is stirring right now and you're wondering what it is. It's Jesus being able to tell you that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been doing, no matter how much you have ridiculed his name, he guess, guess what he says, guess what? I still love you and I want to work with you right where you are. And so he's going to invite you to just come to him right where you are. No, no, no things to hold back except just to say, come to me, ask me for forgiveness, and I will transform your heart and we'll begin to work together right where you are to become Christ-like disciples together. If you're open to praying that prayer, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And nobody praying alone, I'm just going to ask you to repeat these words after me. And remember, they're only words, but if your heart's behind it, if your heart is saying, I, I need this, he's ready. And he's willing to accept you right into his arms today. Would you say this prayer with me? Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that he gave his life to forgive my sins. He was raised from the grave to give me new life. I receive your grace, and by faith, come into my life, and I will follow you. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? I usually like to pause for a few moments because what I'll ask is, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you today? And this week, what are you going to do about it? 